My name is Dushin. I have uh, very modest goals for this panel. I'm trying to change the world, and I'm hoping that uh, Wayne and Jane can help me in my humble quest. Um, uh, we're going to start off with a few intros, uh, and then we'll get to the good stuff. Uh, so this is Fighting Factory Food, the shift to personal produce. Uh, I'm, I'm an outsider in the food industry. Um, I have not made my career in food. Uh, that can often lead to me saying some foolish things, but on occasion, I can offer some different perspectives, uh, which some might find interesting. Um, so I am a technology executive who happens to love food. Uh, last year, I started a company that marries these two passions of mine. It's called Seed Voyage. Uh, and uh, really, it's a simple premise behind this company. I think the best food you're ever going to eat is going to be grown out of your own backyard or out of uh, the backyards and of friends, family, uh, people in your community. This is where the quality, freshness, nutrition, uh, all the stuff you want is, is there. Uh, and so what I wanted to do uh, was uh, create a system where we could connect uh, with everyone who grows food so that we can uh, buy and sell fresh whole produce uh, with each other. Uh, about a third of all households grow food for personal consumption, so this is something that a lot of people do, and I just wanted to to get more access to that. Uh, there isn't an online marketplace, and that's what I'm trying to create with Seed Voyage. So if anyone's curious, check it out, uh, seedvoyage.com, free to sign up. Um, so yeah, that's that, uh, and let me turn it over to Jane. Good morning. I'm Jane Dummer, and I, I have been the health expert for CL for three years now. So um, after this, I'm doing another panel at 1030. So um, we need to stay on time. <laughs> um, my background, I did, I am in the food area. I went to University of Guelph, um, went through the training to become a dietitian. Um, didn't really want to work in a hospital for the rest of my life. And so started off in industry and then I've been in a consulting capacity for quite a few years. And the main service within my consulting company is helping mid-sized companies <clears throat> with better for you products, better for you ingredients, um, you know, fairly good integrity and ethics and just trying to um, get good messages out there. So helping them with their marketing, helping them with their communication, helping them navigate um, the ever-changing uh, market and, um, you know, the different food trends, the different health trends, the different diet trends. I have been interested in seeds for quite a few years. I wrote a book on seeds. It was published three years ago, and I have Bianca up at the front here, a team member of mine, and um, she's actually got some candy-coated, chocolate-covered uh, sunflower seeds. Um, and so if you want to grab some at the end, um, that, would be, that would be nice. So um, I am here to talk. Um, about the, um, well, well, we'll talk about it, but I am here to talk about to the, the, I guess maybe the reality versus the dream too, because again, I've been in the field, in the Canadian field over 20 years and I've been doing work in the North American field for the last eight years. Hi, and I'm <clears throat> uh, Wayne Roberts, um, and uh, I'm probably a person you would uh, describe as a food policy wonk, and I'm often re referred to as the grandfather of the food movement in uh, Canada. But um, I started, I've uh, re been retired from uh, Toronto Public Health for about a decade now, and before that I ran an organization called the Toronto Food Policy Council. At the time it was established, which was a way to engage the public in shaping food policy, not just public health experts of various kinds, and not just industry, but to get the population actively involved and, and to deal with issues beyond the normal industrial or public health thing, which is in a city like Toronto, which is the child poverty capital of Canada, there's a lot of people who don't eat anywhere near enough uh, food. And um, when I started, there were three in the world. The only one in a city was in Toronto, and now there's about 400. And it's spread across to Europe. Um, uh, and is sort of going global, and I think it re reflects the rise of the of a food movement which is m mainly made up of uh, people under 30 years of age, which is why I'm referred to as the grandfather of it. So, um, 
And uh, I hooked up with uh, Dushan because I thought he had a, a way into the energy that is coming from civil society at large that's really a driver in food. So as the host said, it's uh, taste, true, and meaning. And so people are looking for true and meaning. And that's now becoming a very dynamic factor in, in the food industry. And um, uh, so I'm very excited to see that discussion taking that on. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot. Uh, so I'm going to make a couple of uh, provocative statements, and I'm going to ask the panelists to uh, to uh, have a discussion with me. Uh, and and we'll we'll leave each of the statements open for any any feedback. Q and A interactive discussion is always great. Um, the first thing I will say is that I believe that food is too cheap. Um, I I think the drive for uh, reducing costs, uh, you know, great job food industry, but but I think we've gone too far. Uh, and I know everyone likes cheap, but there's unintended consequences and sometimes they're very intended consequences. Uh, food variety decreases. So this is just economics, right? I mean, when, when the Ford Model T came out, the whole concept was make it all the same so that people can afford it. Uh, and, and I think we've gone too far on the food side. Uh, we're spending, as a percentage of income in the US and Canada, we're spending well below what uh, people did, what, what, what our parents and grandparents did 20, 30, 40 years ago, and well below what anyone else spends in the developed world, about 6%, 7% of income, which is a really low number. Uh, and what, what that means, in my mind, is that um, the number of varieties of different foods, and, and I'll state a couple of numbers here. So in the early 1900s, you had about 500 different types of tomato that were available for purchase. Now that number is about 30. Um, and I think that's that's just one example, but that cuts across really every every uh, type of food that's that's grown on the produce side. Uh, you have 30% of all food is wasted. To me, you waste things that you don't value. Just a, a general statement, uh, and and that leads to a lot of problems. You have a bunch of the population that is that has is fighting the obesity epidemic and and the other portion of the population doesn't have enough to eat and i think a lot of that is is addressed in this drive to reducing cost and and drive to reducing prices so i think it's actually a problem uh, where i think a lot of other industries generally reducing costs is a good thing so can i ask wayne a question <laughs> based on this so you mentioned toronto is the to poverty for children in is it the currently is it so with food being so cheap how how is that happening in our country that is semi socialist so is and I don't want to put you on the seat because I don't like I like I've worked in clinics where I've worked with disadvantaged and they are consuming four liters of Coca-Cola before 9 a.m. because they have addictions, they have all kinds of other things happening. Um, and Coca-Cola is on sale for 99 cents. But, so when, when I look at our country and, and look at our social network, um, it, and, and that we do have cheap food, we have um, outlets or, you know, department stores or, again, stores like Giant Tiger, where it's super discounted. Um, or, and so, again, I'm just trying to understand um, the the connection, right? Where the, the, is it is it too cheap? And if it is too cheap, then what happens to the people who can't afford it now? Um, really, I, this is a really important uh, conversation, and it's only a conversation because we're not going to be able to knock down the of cheap food of, uh, of thing course. overnight uh, by any stretch of the imagination. But um, I would say, um, if I want to just look at it from my own personal life, when I was born, which is not that long ago, at the end of the Second World War, the average Canadian spent 25% of their income on food and 25% of their income on rent. And the government spent about close to nothing, because we didn't have uh, Medicare, on uh, uh, health, and, and the price of chronic disease would have been at, as close to zero as you can imagine it. And now we've had, and even people on low income ate. Mm -hmm. 
So even though it was a huge portion of your pay packet, they managed to do it. So now, I don't think there's anybody I know of, certainly in Toronto, who pays 25% of their income on rent or a house. Okay. <laughs> and that's easily doubled. Mm -hmm. And uh, food has gone down to about 10%. Um, and we have more poverty and more hunger than we did mm -hmm. in 1945. So there's no relationship between having cheap food and making it accessible to the population. It actually, mm -hmm. sometimes it can help and sometimes it doesn't. It has mm -hmm. no relationship. Okay. Uh, and so, because the industry that pays the worst and that causes poverty is the food industry. Mm -hmm. In order for it to be cheap, that's where, when you talk about child labor as a global thing, usually you see it associated with the textile industry, which is actually a distortion. The center of child labor in, around the world is the food industry. And the lowest wages uh, paid in the country are in the food industry. So you can't talk about we think that cheap food is the solution to poverty. It's the mm -hmm. cause of poverty, mm -hmm. equally. So mm -hmm. uh, it's a big debate. And I would say, from a Canadian point of view, uh, uh, as distinct from a European point of view, the thing to know is that England made one key choice in the 1840s, which led to the formation of Canada, which was they wanted cheap food, cheap grains from Canada to feed their working class, and Germany made another decision, which is they had to have affordable housing in order to have industry. And so people in English-speaking countries have been wed to cheap food for well over a century. And um, so that's why it's not going to be solved overnight. Mm -hmm. It's built into every institution and every part of our culture and, and society. Um, but I believe no problem that we have with food can be solved as long as food is too cheap. And uh, we need to, I think, as public health people and as an industry, try to deal with that reality. Uh, and the timeline on it is the climate and all the things that are uh, related to that. So it's not really a choice. We need to address this issue. So I'll, I'll add a couple of points on that as well. Um, you talk about the impact of cheap food on the actual producers, something like 10 cents of every food dollar actually goes to the person who grew the food uh, and 90 cents goes to the supply chain, logistics, warehousing, shipping, marketing. So uh, this is where the pressure of, of you know, would, to what extent would you be able to take impoverished people out of poverty by allowing them to make a decent wage selling food so that they can actually live a little bit better uh, is is one offset. Um, th the other thing I would say is the the idea of, uh, of, of cheap food, really competing with the processed food industry is is, is a huge challenge because Coca-Cola, as an example, any type of a cola, it is the definition of a mass market commodity product that, that is costs incrementally zero to sell. And to the extent that the food industry needs to compete with that, the, the, the natural food, whole food industry needs to compete with that, really that's what's caused the idea of uh, having standardization across the board and shipping things on bulk um, so that the choice between that Pepsi and that red sphere that looks like a tomato but doesn't taste like one, doesn't smell like one, I, I don't really blame the purchaser for, for going for, for buying the food that is maybe ultra processed relative to the alternative, which is just a, a, a horrible tasting vegetable. Um, so I think in, in trying to compete at the lowest common denominator, I, I'm not too surprised by, by those, those purchasing preferences. Does anyone have else, anything else, comments, questions on that topic before we move on to the next one? Okay. Anything else? Anything else? Okay. Anything else on that? Uh? Um, just the obesity. Um, there's a stat that has just come out of the U.S. and I always question this um, about giving children uh, the trip to Starbucks. And so this is kind of the urban elitist. <laughs> so sugar sweetened cereal, sugar sweetened pop. 
And now it's sugar sweetened coffees. Third. Okay. Yeah. In in and I mean again that's that's a parenting behavior that's convenient. They're going to a high end coffee shop and they're bringing their young kids in and the kids are now <clears throat> drinking it. So so that's that's in like again the the obesity issue is multifactorial and it's you know there's so many things happening there's nobody in the home at all there's no backbone in the home making meals from scratch so um, you know in 1950 unfortunately it was usually the woman but there was usually a backbone in the house and the majority now dashboard dining or just as my example. Parents are taking their kids to Starbucks and getting them hooked on sugar sweetened coffee. So here's a question about the foods um, about how you're saying that tomato doesn't smell like tomato. Is it that the growers are not growing high quality vegetables? It's uh, two main contributors. Uh, one is that uh, tomatoes have been bred for everything other than nutrition and taste. So they've been bred to ship easily, to be uniform, to be consistent, to look nice and red, to be circles, a nice sphere. That's that's what the breeding has led to because that's, again, how you standardize and that's how you sell a product. Um, and the bulk tomatoes, they're they're picked green. I mean, this is no surprise. They're picked green. They're transported thousands of kilometers, and uh, they're not what a tomato actually is. Uh, so that's that's really what it. And, and the second piece of it is um, uh, soil erosion. Uh, the the soil actually used to be used to used to have micronutrients in it. Uh, Fifty years ago, the average uh, vegetable and fruit was about 50 to 75 percent more nutritious than what it is now. Uh, now when you, it's it's just, it's something that again looks like a fruit and a veggie, but it doesn't have the same level of nutritional content. Uh, and, and again, that's, that's a soil issue. So those would be the two main factors. Let's, uh, I'm going to go on to the, another statement because you, you talked about the convenience aspect, which is, I think, an important topic in my mind. Um, one of the things in the food industry that is huge, really, it's either price or it's convenience. How do I make this easier and simpler? And in my mind, convenience is nice, but there's the other side of the equation, uh, which is it comes at a cost. Things that are convenient don't have as much meaning. Um you know, maybe this is an unfair parallel, but relationships I find are very inconvenient, but they actually have a lot of meaning, human relationships. And when a Facebook comes in to substitute human relationships for clicks, tweets, likes, it, it pales in comparison. It leads to problems. And this is just me on my little philo philosophy corner. But the same thing happens with food is when we get into... Um, the meal kit industry, which I'm personally skeptical of, just me, um, uh, prepackaged. Uh, every time uh, a, a premium food company focuses on convenience, something is lost in that equation. And and I would just I would like to see a little bit more of that trade off analysis for for the food industry, which is by making this more convenient, what are we losing? Because again, this is another one where I think we're going too far into the convenience side of things. I know you totally disagree, which well, is great. No, I don't totally disagree. Again, it goes back to that consumer. So when I look at when I've worked like consumer to consumer, and when we talk about, you know, cooking, cooking from scratch, you know, not maybe cooking semi from scratch. They're not interested. Like, I mean, they're wanting to maybe do it as a hobby and not do it three times a day. So the whole idea of what constitutes a meal, there's a whole target market that they want convenience. They want 
snacks. They want mini meals. They want that dashboard dining. They, you know, you can't have a complete meal as you're driving or at your desk. So I, I want everyone to eat from scratch. Like, again, because I am trained as a health professional, I do want that. Um, people say they're too busy. I'm like, how much screen time are you in a day, right? How much time are you spending on Facebook? Why don't you like get off Facebook and make a meal? <laughs> and um, people are not prioritizing it. And I don't, again, we can't fix that in, um, but yeah, people are ignoring their necessity. Like, I'm not gonna get into it too much, but the whole sleep side of things. So basics like healthy eating and sleeping, they're very two problematic things right now. Um, because people are not prioritizing the basic needs for that. Wayne? <clears throat> well, um, I'm I may be the only uh, person here from a professional public health uh, background. Uh, and if you came to a public health conference as a person from the industry, you would be the only industry person. And if you uh, went to a food movement meeting, you probably would be the only uh, if you belong to a large company, the only large industrial company. So the reality of um, food is that nobody is talking to one another. That's the, the starting point, in my opinion, of what the problem is and of how you begin to address the solution. Is You can't have a public health people talking about where, where food should be going and they're not having any conversations with uh, industry or the other way well, and around. And they're just writing policy. I've, mm -hmm. I've spent time in public health, and they're just writing policy. Yeah. They're not executing. That's right. And so we, yes. we have a fantastic um, a food guide, I think, in Canada, one, one of the best in the world, the first one to actually address not only the question of the nutrients in food, but how you eat, which they put on par, that eat, sitting, eating calmly in a social setting uh, with family or friends, is as important as the nutrients in the food. So public health has never been in that space before. Um, so there's lots of things happening, but they're happening on their own. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, industry wasn't even involved in that. They only found out about the fact that a new food guy was coming out of, you know, a few months before and, and tried to engage in the conversation, but the train had already left the station. So um, a... a the guy who worked next to me at public health was a whiz at uh, solving the Rubik's Cube, and he could do anything th you would do to it. He On my government dollar? Was he <laughs> solving that? <laughs> On coffee breaks, he would do that, and um, and he could do it in a minute. And so I got to think a lot about Rubik's Cubes, um, uh, uh, and um, it struck me that the problem with food is it is a Rubik's Cube. You cannot solve the six sides of the problem by only looking at one side. You've got to solve all six sides at the same time. And I think those six sides, from my point of view, are uh, health, economy, environment, community, culture, and personal agency or empowerment. And somebody else may have their own six, but you can't do, you can't solve it on one side. And so we have an entire country and a continent actually is trying to solve it one side at the time. And the business people are only asking the economy question and somebody else is only asking the health. And it's all going nowhere because you can't solve it on one side. And so when you get to convenience, it has to fit in there. And it's not one of the six factors I listed. That's not how humans survived as a species. It's not how we're going to go forward as a species. It's not in the big six. So uh, I think it has to be knocked off it. And we have to find a way to help industry not cater to it and still be able to survive. So uh, that's a good transition there because I the, 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 those were my high level dream world concepts. But then, Jane, you're talking about people just want convenience. And my my answer to that is uh, the food industry, I find, and policy industry generally doesn't focus as, as much on the demand side of the equation, which is, again, uh, where do you prioritize your time? Where do people prioritize their time? And and I can say that um, I went through a process of where I changed my buying patterns quite a bit, and a lot of it was driven by one simple change that I 
made in my life and that I grew some food. I, I did a garden and, uh, and I would say that it's, it's, I have yet to find a person that grows a little bit of food that, that doesn't want or isn't interested in having more natural homegrown food that, uh, and, and I live in Canada, so obviously I can't grow food year round. But the fact that I've gone down this path also makes me much more aware of what I'm purchasing, where I'm spending my money, what's what are the ingredients, what's the transparency, the quality, nutrition. All of these things are things I care about a lot more since I became a bit more aware of the process of growing a little bit of food and what it's supposed to taste like and how it's supposed to make me feel. And I would say that... Uh, I think it would be great for the food industry and it would be great for society as a whole if some food, you know, premium food company executives out there actually had a little food garden, encouraged their employees to grow. Employees are consumers. And and this is something that actually is happening. Um, some of the industry statistics uh, that I was surprised by uh, is... Um, uh, so about a third of all households grow food, but the biggest growth driver in those households is the younger demographic, the 18 to 35 year old, the so-called millennials. Um, they have that portion of the population uh, has a, is, is spending about 80 percent more per year on food gardening than they were five years ago. And that portion is uh, is is has grown about 65% in the past five years. So the fact that it isn't, you know, the, the seniors out there, which are you, generally, they're the ones you think of when you think of food growers, it's the younger group. And I would contend that that's a meaningful data point. Um, some might argue that this is a little novelty that doesn't mean anything food growing for the younger generation, but I actually think there is some value there. And that's something that food, the food industry should try to, understand more and tap into a little bit more. No, I agree. And I, I believe, you know, more so in a, a large multinational food company, there are people in there that don't even cook, let alone grow their own food. Um, they're there as business people. And and so when I talked about my consulting, I like the mid-sized companies because they're usually genuine food people who are interested in the entire in the entire piece. Um, I, I have a question for you. What was the motivating factor, if you can reveal it in front of us, that made you grow some food? Like, what was the turning point? Did you just get some seeds from somebody and plant them? Or did you consciously say, was there a turning point? Was there, like, a combination of factors? Like, what, what was the piece that made you do it and keep doing it? Yeah, yeah, so this was... Uh Three years ago or so, um, really the driving factor was uh, I had kids uh, that became of the age where I I, uh, I thought it would be fun to have a garden with them. Um, we moved, uh, so in, in the previous place where I lived, we didn't really have much of a yard. We moved to a place that has a little bit more space. And I remember fond memories being a kid and having my pa parents have a garden and I thought, well, this, this is probably going to be fun with the kids to try and get them a little bit more active. Because we fight the same battles that I'm sure everyone battles, which is got to eat all your vegetables, don't eat the chocolate bars, all that stuff. And I thought this would be a way to get them more actively engaged. And, and it was a tremendous success. I mean, for me personally, the food was unbelievably good. My kids were excited about what was growing in the garden and and excited the more excited about picking the the cherry tomatoes than they were about eating the 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 chips and chocolate bars uh, and and this is the cool thing about food is that it's one of the few things that anyone can do. Um, I can't really do anything else. I mean, as far as building my own car or or clothes or I mean, we're in a society where you don't have all this, the requisite skills to do it as well as the so-called experts. But food is the exception. Food is is the one thing that you put a little seed into some soil and it will be better than than what anyone else can do in the food industry. It's kind of a cool thing. Um, so that's what got me doing it. And that's why. And then that's what led me to the view that why am I not eating way more homegrown produce? Uh, and and the reason why is because I can't grow everything I'd like to grow. I still a small yard. 
Uh, I know people around me are growing, so let's create, let's try to create this marketplace where more people can enjoy homegrown food. And, and I think, again, the, the, the side benefits to the food industry as a whole is I, my spending patterns are a lot different from what they were years ago. Much more farmer's market visits, much more understanding of what's in the food that I'm eating. Uh, and I think that's something that you'll probably end up finding if you do have a garden or if you want to start one. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So it was having children yeah. and being responsible for their health, basically. That was a big thing. And, and a fun event. Sure. Like a fun thing. Okay, so that now that sounds good. But I do I do like your point. And I think food companies to survive need to make sure they're getting people in with that type of community, with that type of understanding about food. The days of, you know, the again, the white male executive who's you know, hiring people who aren't qualified and there's food outbreaks and, you know, those companies, their their legs are shaking, right? Those big, huge companies. So I don't know if a community garden would help out the culture within those companies or not. Um, I think, you know, your sweet spot for your quest, and I think where it could make the most impact would be like a mid a mid-sized company. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I would, that's where I think my focus is because the large companies, we know what they compete on, right? It's, it's a convenience accessibility. It's, I mean, McDonald's is popular because there's 5,000 of them and, and you know what you're getting. It's all, it's consistency, it's price, it's accessibility. That's their, that's how they sell. Uh, but that's, I mean, the small to mid-sized companies, that's not how they can sell. They have to sell on other value propositions. And that to me is where having an understanding of what food is supposed to be. And, and again, in my mind, from what I've seen, it can be an addictive process to have an executive at a, at a food company bring in some of his some or his or her f fresh tomatoes and share them with the staff and have encourage other people to grow food because again th that to me is what speaks to a transition that could and should happen in having people value food to a, a greater than de degree than just have it be a commodity a commodity only serves the top one or two companies in any industry um everyone else kind of falls off the wayside. And I don't think that benefits anyone in this room, anyone at this conference, unless you're, you know, General Mills, McDonald's, the usual suspects, right? Well, you know, I just um, came back from uh, Las Vegas, and so the first thing people wanted to know is how much I, money I lost gambling or how many shows or whatever. But I was there for a school garden uh, conference, and it has, uh, Las Vegas has more school gardens than any city in North America. And um, it's considered to be the capital of school uh, gardens. And the reason why is that the great majority of people who uh, live in um, Las Vegas are poor because they work uh, in the service industry. And um, their schools are consequently uh, centers of uh, poverty and a lot of uh, trauma. And so the thing that sh shocked me about their school gardens program is that the teachers who are really f uh, keen about it don't see it so much for food as for mental health. So when a kid is acting out in the class, they take them to the garden and they got to get them to cool down. And they, if they tell them to take three breaths, deep breaths and calm down, the kid will go even more berserk. So they go to the mint and the lavender section of their garden and tell them to take three deep breaths. And uh, I suppose the lavender and mint do something, but the three deep breaths are what do it. So they use gardens to self-regulate people. But well, I think our whole continent has lost the ability to self-regulate. Like we, you know, you're in such a rush, you don't realize, well, actually, if you don't have a regular amount of sleep, you're, you're gonna do yourself harm. Whatever rush you're in, it's gonna you got you got to be in a big rush because you're gonna lose 20 years of your life. <laughs> and the same with food. It's like we need to self-regulate a bit. That sort of to me is a starting point. If you look at what's happening to Heinz, I think it is a very very good memo to get, which is the smartest guy in America in terms of buying stocks, the Wizard of Omaha, 
bought into that company and has controlling, uh, well, you know, he's one of the controlling shareholders of it, and they don't know what the hell to do. The industry is needs to take a couple of deep breaths, and we need to have it across the population cool the rage a bit and and start you know do some meditation or whatever and start to have a serious conversation because it's going off the rails. That's where the conversation is going now. And we got to get it back on the rails. We're uh, probably approaching our time limit. Any questions? Yeah, go ahead. I, I mean, that is a, a really good point. And I live in a community um, where they sell a ton of unpasteurized apple cider, especially around September or October. And there's always E. coli outbreaks. Um, but you know, it's farm fresh, it's at the side of the road. So I, I, I agree that like when we're looking at the Rubik's Cube of this whole idea, that could be a, a huge unintended consequences, right? So when you're looking at rodents, you know, that's, uh, that's more, again, it depends what diseases they're carrying and that. Um, but it's when, when you get um, mishandling. So, um, and just to your point, when I'm looking at the grocery stores and they're telling people to bring in their containers from home and uh, refill them there, that, that's scary me because, um, you know, I've been in the washroom where people don't wash their hands and then they're going to bring their container and then, you know, so.